Okay, following up on what we did in the lab, got a couple of tubes here uh, with or a couple of cylinders with tubes of equal diameter. Then we fill the cylinder, and water flows out the tubes and the familiar way, and exactly as you would expect, the more the water gets, the slower the exit. And we can determine what the exit velocity was by just letting the water exit and fall to the floor or to something in a bucket on the floor, hopefully. Uh, yeah, we were doing this outside, but then it got windy and that would have screwed it up. Um, so we were able to determine as a function of the length. And we got two lengths here, L1 and L2. Right? L2 being the greater length because you get less velocity for given depth, right? So we get a graph. And the ideal, I guess, just by assuming no dissipative forces. So why is it that these two graphs are lower? Can you give me a statement that tells me why those graphs uh, lie lower than the one for the ideal? Okay. So yeah, these are lower, uh, meaning that the exiting water has less kinetic energy than what we would predict for the ideal. It's got less velocity, it's got less kinetic energy, but the potential energy change at a given depth is the same. So, That's, that's the same for every case. Now, L2 is greater than L1. The exit KE given the potential energy is less. Now, where is a line on this graph? <clears throat> what would the direction of a line on this graph be uh, to represent a constant change in potential energy? Well, what is it that determines a change in potential energy for a given time, for a given time increment. Okay, do we made that connection? So That's a constant change of potential energy 
per volume increment. Okay. So if you lose a gram of water up here, you know what the potential energy change is, you know the depth. Okay. So my question then is, How do you find that the pressure loss in the tube given depth? Or How do we find pressure loss at a given flow velocity for a given length once you've got the graph? Okay. So again, we're looking at this system. Um, and this just consists of a jar with a little bit of water in it and a tube coming out of the top. And the hole on the top is a little bit, the diameter of the hole is somewhat less in the diameter of the tube. So when I pull the tube through, it seals nicely. Um, if I then immerse this in hot water, keeps the air up, the air pressure increases, meaning the pressure on this layer of water here increases, which tends to push the water down. And water wants to go down, and it's going down a little badly, badly enough that it forces water up into the tube. Now, as we saw, we can heat it up so that this tube, which is best part of a meter, I'd say 70, 87 meters, let's see, it's about 73 centimeters, <laughs> roughly three quarters of a meter. And, and if you count it from the water up, it's 80 centimeters a little more. Uh, so if we heat it up, water will rise in the tube. Now, if we change the potential energy of the system, well, you have the water in the tube has more potential energy than the water that was originally here. Okay, the tube is now full. So we got water, you know, that much water higher than it was, okay? Uh, now, that's not a lot of potential energy because this tube is pretty thin. But we do gain some potential energy. So we gain mechanical energy just by raising water in the tube. Now, if the water's, you know, if, if we get this thing warm enough, that water will start coming out the top and we can collect it at this point. So we can increase the potential energy of whatever water comes out. Okay. We just take the weight of the water that comes out, and if we've collected it up here, then we multiply that weight by the 80 centimeters, and there's our change in potential energy, that being equal and opposite to the work done by gravity. Water being raised, force of gravity being down, gravity does negative work, uh, gravity being a conservative force that entails potential energy change is equal and opposite to the work done by gravity. And I got to keep repeating that because it stays important in the whole semester. As a matter of fact, it gets more and more important. Um, okay. So we get mechanical work. Now we want to start 
quantifying these things. In order to understand what goes on in the gas, in the confined gas here, uh, we need to develop a little bit of what's called kinetic theory. Now, I'm assuming you know about PV equals NRT and everything that we said chemistry. And you can review that in the text, once you have basic working knowledge of that, but you're gonna see how that works. Um, we'll pause for a second. Okay. So we just start out with a model of a mass M. Move the velocity V. Bouncing back and forth between two walls of length L. Now the introductory problem sets state the situation in more detail, which is why I want you to pay attention to them. Okay. Read it, understand how the problem is phrased uh, in its full glory. But it's a simple idea. Things bouncing back and forth. It's moving at velocity V. Okay. So what average force does it exert on the wall to the right? Okay, so we've got, got some good answers. You know, what are we going to use to get the average force? And somebody said, well, we're going to use MV. Said, well, what's MV? Well, that's no matter. Okay. I said, okay. The collision's elastic. If the collision's elastic, then momentum's conserved, as well, it always is in a closed system, and energy's conserved. Since energy's conserved, velocity, Speed. No, no, it's more. So, um, the wall is essentially an infinite mass. Okay. In an elastic collision, it just follows that the speed doesn't change. That goes back to the relative velocity is the same after collision as it is before collision. Okay. Um, or, no. Relative velocity reverses in a, an elastic collision. We talked about that. That's what it comes to. I don't want to go into all those details, look them up, go back and review it, try to get the ideas in your head even better than you have. You know, you have to pretty good. Okay, so bottom line. Magnitude of your change in velocity is twice the velocity because it's coming in this fast, now it's going away that fast. Coming in at 10 miles an hour, leaving at 10 miles an hour. And then if it met itself, if, if it met its reflection on the path or if it passed its reflection, the relative velocity would be 20 meters per second, right? So, you know, to convince yourself of this, okay, V changes the collision. Magnitude of the change in V is 2V. And magnitude is 2MV. Your delta MV. Vector V is negative two MV. So sort that out. Think about it. It has to be so put a few numbers on it. 10 meters per second this way, 10 meters per second this way. Your change is negative 20 meters per second, and that would be negative two V. 
or multiplied by mass negative two m. Right. Okay, so there's our change in momentum. Now we're going to use impulse momentum. Right, because we would have put a bar and an arrow, but that would have been confusing. Okay. Average force times delta P is a change in momentum. Okay, average force is negative 2 mv over delta T. So what's delta T? Well, I think he's getting it hits and hits and hits and hits and hits because it's bouncing back and forth elastically. Perpendicular to the walls. So, in one way or another, it stays between the walls. Okay. Maybe it's infinite walls. I don't know. Okay. So, what's delta T? Well, delta T is the time it takes between hits. We're talking about the right wall. So delta T is the time between collisions with the right wall. It's not the time between collisions here and collisions here. Okay. So that's very straightforward. Delta T is 2L over V. And how far does it go? Between collisions here, it goes twice the length. And that's not its displacement, but that's the distance it travels. It's displacement between here and here is zero. Displacement being a vector. Okay. The vector from this collision here to the collision here is zero, but the path it follows has length 2L. Okay. Well, Let's make it then be squared over 2L. And we are there. And that's the average force. Is that the force on the right wall or the force on the particle? How many think the right wall? How many think the particle? Yeah, kind of seems to thumbs down. It's on the particle because this is the change in the momentum of the particle, okay? It's pretty obvious if the particle is going to be going this way and then comes back this way, that the force exerted on it's in this direction, right? Yeah, just you know, sort out the details of that, make sure. And the average force on the wall is the 
footsteps. And that's what you expect. If you're standing behind the wall, and, so, and this is a bowling ball bouncing back and forth at a high velocity, you're going to be experiencing some force, right? And you're going to have to push the wall. Well, if you're standing this way, you're going to have to push it this way to avoid the bowling ball from knocking you down. Over there. Okay. Well, that's essentially what's going on in the jaw. Except that the particle is bouncing around in three dimensions and you're confining the thing to the same. Okay. Now the development here and the development we're using this course, you can read the textbooks on explanation, but this is what we're doing here is a little easier to understand. Um, if you now have length L cross sexual area ACS, same situation, but now you can find Then the average force of the wall is MV squared over 2L. What's the pressure of the wall? It didn't screw up, so. I knew I was going to divide these twos out and let him just start writing them. There's no two here. There's no two here. There would have never been a two here. On me. Not one here. So here's what we get. Here's our expression for the pressure. The average pressure. Let's put a P bar there. It's not an arrow. It's not a vector. Pressure is not a vector quantity. Okay. Although you can do pressure times a unit normal and get a vector. Well, we can tell about L times ACS. What, what's that significance for the soil? Just volume. Yeah, I should have had that pause. Oh. Um, but yeah, that's volume. And what's MV squared remind you of? Well, it's pretty obviously kinetic energy, right? But what we have here is two times the kinetic energy over the volume. No, the average kinetic energy of particles is a measure of temperature. So it's like you got temperature is some multiple of, sorry, pressure, some multiple of temperature over volume, PV equals NRT. Okay, more particles and all that stuff. Now we got a question. Okay, the question was how that end up being two kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. Well, Kinetic energy is one half mv squared, that's mv squared. That's one of the oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it? Okay. So A is a constant. So that AT would be the kinetic energy of a single particle. Term. Now, all these connections.
after set, start with this. Then they say, well, if you're in three dimensions and you got a bunch of particles, then they're bouncing off of each other, so their directions, their velocities are all random. Okay. Only the component of velocity in the direction perpendicular to the surface results in a force, results in a momentum change, because that's the only component that changes. Now you got to read that. It's simple. I'm not going to go over the details of it. I'm kind of going over the details of this. We've got the impulse momentum here. When you go to three dimensions, your average velocity in the x direction is the same as the average velocity in the y is the same as the average velocity in the z. So Average velocity in every direction is the same. So that and of course your velocity, your vector velocity has a magnitude of vx squared plus vy squared plus vz squared, that's your average velocity. You got this VRMS, I never did get a good ex explanation of until I worked it out for myself when I took the course. Okay, it might have been a good explanation, I was just too dumb to understand it until I figured it out for myself. What's VRMS mean? It means you square the average velocities in the individual directions. You square the mean average velocity. That's the mean and root mean. Square is obvious. And to get V, you take the square root of this, right? I'll say VRMS. R's over these V's. That's what we mean by root mean square. We just have the squares of the average X, Y, and Z velocities and so forth. Okay. Kinetic energies, average kinetic energies, going to borrow where everyone knows our arrows. These are all equal on the average. So this, this. Bind to tell you that each of these is equal to one third the average kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is equal partition. Among three independent directions of space. Now there's a lot more I could say about that. You know what happens if your container is irregular and so forth. Since you have equal partition among three independent directions of space, uh, you can do this same analysis on any small area increment. And it works out. So you find that the pressure is the 
uniform. God, I can't read that. I wrote a bell. Uniform throughout. Same pressure everywhere. Assuming it's a small container. Now, if the container is eight miles high, atmosphere is thinner up here than it is down here, so pressures will change. Okay. So I'll say as long as altitude differences. Insignificant. Another Static energy for particles, three halves kT. Okay. You can get that out of here. This could be written as pressure times volume is 2 kE. Okay, so that we understand that this is divide the PV by the N, you get two KT, and for a one dimensional gas, gas. Where all the particles are moving in one dimension. Uh, this is your total kinetic, this is your kinetic energy per particle. Okay. Now, if you're in three dimensions, your kinetic energy per particle is only one third of that. So you put that all together, you solve this for KT, you get PV over 2N, and you split it into three parts, and you get this. Okay, uh, the introductory problem says so work out the details that I don't want to try to explain all that in the short time we have. Okay, make sense? So the introductory problem says so connect all this, they give you all this. Then your book gives it to me in a little more abstract fashion that applies to um, a container of any shape. In the way I just said, you just take a small surface area and commit, you choose your x, y, and z axes accordingly, and you make the same argument that we're making through here. Okay, you need to pull those details together, but they're not difficult. Uh, this allows you to calculate the velocity of a particle. You set that equal to one half mass of a particle times v squared. If you measure the mass of the particle, which we've done very accurately using cross electric magnetic fields, cross electric and magnetic fields, and stuff like that, by measuring radius and curvature of different particles exposed to magnetic fields perpendicular to the velocity and measuring the charge and all that stuff. And we do that later in the course, so we don't have to know that now. But we can measure the masses of the atoms measure masses of charged particles uh, very accurately. Okay. 
Of course, we have atomic numbers. We have Avogadro's number. I expect you to remember that from chemistry. Uh, or that when it comes up in the introductory problems that you recognize it, you know what it means, okay? It's all building blocks that you might not have thought about for a while, but you put them all together in a fairly simple way and you get this whole kinetic theory. Okay. Now let's think about what happens just in one dimension because it extends easily to three dimensions. We just look at it in one dimension. We're really talking about three dimensions. This is not just BS. Okay. Whatever direction you want to be perpendicular to this wall. What's going to happen to the velocity of this particle if the wall is moving toward it? Turn it elastic. Increase. Sorry. Okay, looks like things are getting blurry over here. I don't know how long they've been blurry. I don't know, I've been blurry for a while. But Camera to focus. Okay, so hopefully that, all that's been focused enough that you can read it, but there it is. And again, it's I'm just sketching what the introductory problem sets will connect. Okay, in very manageable steps. Okay, so you got this. Situation again, assume this is your Vx. And now ask what happens if this wall is moving in this direction. What's going to happen? Well, immediately got an answer. Well, it's going to get faster. The velocity of the or the speed of the mass is going to increase at collision every time it collides when something's coming toward it. It's kind of intuitively obvious, especially if you've played the usual game on the interstate. Uh, you go out running toward a car and see. If your speed increases, and you, you got to put yourself in some kind of perfectly elastic suit or something. Uh, you can imagine doing that, actually, but you know, please don't. Uh, I don't think there's anything to save your life uh, with that kind of velocity change that happens that quickly. I think you kind of liquefy. Uh, but anyhow, okay. Um, the other way of saying that, that I thought I was going to have to say, and somebody said it immediately, beautifully, thank you, that was a wonderful response, the relative velocity, okay, has to reverse. And if you think about it, then, if the relative velocity reverses and this has a velocity toward it, it's going to end up going away faster. So you work that out. If that, if that's not clear to you, work it out with symbols. Um, okay. Well, what that does then is that increases the velocity. Okay. Now, let me back up a second. You know that PV equals NKT. Okay. I you probably think of it as NRT. R and K are just related by Avogadro's constant. You multiply R by Avogadro's constant, you get M, okay? And the dimensions of R are joules per particle, or joules per mole Kelvin. Avogadro's number is the number of particles in a mole. So if you divide R by Avogadro's number, you get K. So they can talk about N, big N times K is the same as little n times R. Number of moles times R, is the number of particles times K. Therefore, K is R divided by Avogadro's one. It's 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per particle Kelvin. R is 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. You want to know those. At least you want to know R. 
Anyone not have a God that is not raised? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power. I think. That's a little weird. In, in, in high school, I learned it at 6.023, and they did apparently more accurate measurements, and it rounded off a little lower. It might even be 6.023. Okay. Another thing, my physics teacher in high school, probably one of the reasons I'm doing what I'm doing now, one of the main reasons, is a bit nuts. Uh -huh. When his son was born, he named him Scott Sweaterich. Middle name, Avogadro. <laughs> Scott Avogadro Sweaterich. He was no nerd. I mean, he was a machinist at night and an excellent physics and chemistry teacher during the day. And one of the last guys you would want to mess with. <laughs> uh, but he's a little bit nuts, yeah, in, in a good way. We, we really liked the guy. After he scared the hell out of us the first day, we found he was really a nice guy. Once he established discipline. Yeah. Uh, okay, so... Just a little connection with Avogadro. Okay. Uh, as it applies, well, here. You heat this up. You increase the average kinetic energy per particle. Okay. Which is why pressure increases the volume stays constant. Because the kinetic energy increases. This is related to kinetic energy in a way I want you to really understand by next time. Okay? I sketched most of it out with the rest of the details together. Uh, so the particles get moving faster. So they hit the water harder. So they were in equilibrium. I mean, they're, you know, they're already hitting the water pretty hard. Okay? Increase the temperature, they start hitting it harder, which puts more pressure on the water, which puts more force on the water, which is what pushes water down. It's not just the fact that you increase the temperature, you increase the pressure. Here's why that increases the pressure. You want to understand it as deeply as you can. And that pushes water down, pushes water up in the tube, pushes water in the container down, pushes water up in the tube, and does mechanical work. So now you have The connection between heat and mechanical work, which is the foundation of thermodynamics. Now, the questions of how much heat, how much work, and so forth, pressure volume diagrams, well, we're going to develop that plan state. Okay. So we're out of time. You understand? I want you to at least read all the problems in the introductory problem set that have to do with heat and thermodynamics. This takes you all the way through some of the main conclusions of thermodynamics without actually totally deriving it, but it derives a lot. Okay? I want you to be familiar with that so you'll be able to understand the stuff that I go through as quickly as I've gone through this. Okay? I'll be a little more detailed because we really want to get in to the efficiency of this process. Like, for a given change in temperature, how high should we collect the water that comes out of that tube to get as much mechanical work as possible? If we go too high, we don't get any water out of the tube. We just get the water in the tube, but there isn't much. If we go too low, we haven't raised it very high, and we don't get much. You end up getting an expression. You got to take a derivative of to maximize, and it'll be the hairiest derivative you've ever dealt with. Okay, it's kind of neat the way it hangs together. So uh, you have that to look forward to, and then yeah, we'll do some experiments with it. We from Pi. Okay, so again, nail, I, I don't expect you to absolutely nail the introductory problem sets, but I want you to understand them pretty well. So read them. 
think there are maybe 20 problems, maybe you know, low 20s, maybe high teens that relate to heat thermodynamics. Some of them are just calorimetry. You can read those. You don't even really have to read those right now, but maybe you want to refresh yourself a little. Make sense? Okay. A lot of them are very simple. Some of them maybe require a little more thought. 